I, I would say always go, always pay the extra money to go to a firm that just practices in this area. And yes, you will pay more. Done. I grant you that than ordering a form. But I, I can tell you the benefits so far outweigh the additional costs that it's an insult to, to your intelligence to decide that you're going to save $400 or whatever it is by ordering a form. It's just, right. it makes no sense. I mean, this is going to impact the rest of your life. Uh, yeah, and everything's on the table. And, and you get what you pay for. You re- they're missing things. They definitely are. I've yeah. recently looked at one uh, because I have a very big family and I had a sibling who didn't want to come to me <laughs> and downloaded oh, a form. Siblings don't like for other siblings to see their <laughs> no. stuff. And so they sent me the form and sure enough, there was no authority with respect to digital assets, meaning anything that's electronically held there. It didn't provide any authority whatsoever. And now there are laws both in Missouri, Illinois and, and many other states that uh, will back up those things provided that the authority is given in the East documents. And we spell out those provisions very carefully because there are things that are practical and there are even digital assets that are sentimental. And you want your power of attorney to be able to access all of those. Life's Third Act is a podcast dedicated to helping you get the most out of your retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, attorney CPA Joe Cordell features guests each week to discuss prominent topics for those over 55. Here's attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Welcome to another episode of Life's Third Act. This week, we're going to talk a little bit about how do you plan to take care of yourself for the balance of your life, including when you might become less able to care for yourself. You know, what what are there, what things from a legal perspective should every one of you have in place? So that's a sort of self-interested argument, or it's a topic, but it also helps others in lots of ways too. But the other question becomes, well, even if you have someone to manage your assets or to take care of you if, if, as you get older, maybe you have a stroke or something, what about ultimately assuring that your assets go where you want them to go, whatever's left? You know, do you want to distribute them immediately? Do you want to just give them to your kids outright and and let them have the money? Do you instead want to maybe have it distributed over time? So I present it this way because often lawyers, when they start talking about these subjects, which are very practical, they they use phrases that are very boring and I suspect would lose your interest. So I'm not calling this estate planning because really it's a little more than estate planning. But but if you're looking for a heading for our discussion, commonly people call this that. But I want you to understand how real and critical the things we're talking about are. They're not just things that that are nice to have. They're things that are essential to have to, to protect and take care of you, as well as to assure that the things you spent a lifetime acquiring go to the people you want them to go to. So that's the topic. It's interesting, Jill, that we're sponsored by Tucker Allen. Yes. So you'd think we'd talk a lot about stuff relating to these topics, trust, et cetera. And the reality is we don't talk about it very much. And so I think we're falling down on the job. So I, I think it's critical. We're getting back on track, though, today. Yeah, we're getting on track. And, uh, and, and we owe it to you for, to, to put these topics in front of you periodically. So that's what we're doing. And as it turns out, we have a marvelous guest, someone who is uh, immensely qualified to discuss these topics. And, and this is the managing attorney with Tucker Allen, Nina Winsor. Thank you, Nina. Thank you for having me, Mr. Cordell. Uh, so where should we start, Jill? Well, we need to get to know Nina. Now, I yeah. know you made a career change. At some point in your life, you were doing something in, related to business management, and then you decided to take— I don't think I knew this. Yeah. So I had a bit of a, be- a banking background, and I had um, worked a little bit in a family business, actually, prior to that, um, doing some asset management. And uh, so the banking was kind of in line with that, but really— um, and always had a interest in taxation. So I uh, had a— um, went to law school and got a degree, uh, JD, in taxation. And um, 
everybody thinks that sounds really boring, but I found it to be extremely interesting. Yeah. But but early in your career, you were with a uh, a major law firm, a large law firm. I was, and uh, and of course, those clients were largely what what in among lawyers we call high net worth, mm-hmm. meaning there are people who. Um, who had problems that are addressed by these very complex tax and other vehicles. And so it's it's very challenging to do that type of planning. And it's and I'm impressed with the fact that you uh, you've made a kind of a shift in your career when you come on board as a managing attorney of uh, Tucker Allen mm-hmm. because, you know, the target clientele for Tucker Allen is the middle class. Correct. So it's that, you know, when you think about a bell curve, it's that curve in the, in the that big bow is the middle. So Absolutely. So uh, Tucker Allen has always felt its mission is to serve, you know, that, 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 that huge swath of people that are out there versus, you know, this elite few. And, and so we think from a marketing standpoint, as well as, as from a standpoint of client care, it's, it's better, but does it require a little bit of shift because your strategies have to be different when you're solving middle class estate planning so- issues versus slightly but it requires that same mentality of trying to see around a corner every single family ha- needs a very specific approach and sometimes i feel like people in the middle class or just the average person um, have not received that level of specificity with their planning or understand that they need planning at all um, so what this a- allows me to do is sit down with the average person and really make them feel empowered that they are getting something that is very specific to their situation because every situation is different. Um, So even though an ultra high net worth client requires a lot of specific planning, the average person has a unique situation. They may have a unique family situation. They may have a family member with special needs. They just may have very specific desires of how they want things to go for the money that they've worked so hard for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that deserves a same level of attention um, as anyone else. So then let's, uh, let's assume that you have a client who's come in. We'll assume they're 60 or so years old. They tell you that uh, they've accumulated maybe a million dollars in this world. They do have a few children, adult, we'll assume. Um, we'll assume that they have jobs, but they're not real financially secure. So they have some concerns about their children, helping their children eventually. We'll assume they're married. Uh, now, how do you introduce this topic to this person uh, of the the, the things that they need to do and why they need to do them. Can you give kind of an overview of what you would... Sure. Uh, so for a couple, one of the things to look for is, is there a huge discrepancy in the way that assets are held or income? You know, you want to see who's still earning money and are they earning much more than the other spouse? Because one of the primary concerns that couples have is, is depending on who passes away. And they may have made an assumption of who's going to pass away first, which doesn't always end up being the case. So we try to help them reframe looking at things from both perspectives of who would be the first to pass. And then seeing, okay, what is is our disaster preparedness plan at that point? What can we put in place for you? And often Um, when they come in, that might be because somebody has gotten maybe one of the parties a a diagnosis or yeah, something. Yeah, it's a crisis situation. But at that you would point. be surprised that they actually will not always upfront tell you that it's a, it's necessary to really spend the time with someone to get to know all the things that have happened in their life and to see the you know the worth and their goals up until that point, maybe before any health crisis would have come into play. And sometimes we don't find out until almost the very end of an appointment um, with someone that there is a pending health concern. Concern, uh, because they become comfortable enough to share that with you. Right. So that's why it's so important, regardless, you know, this is not legal Zoom, right? We need to actually develop these client relationships to get the information to be able to present that specifically tailored solution. And you know what's so amazing, and we've talked about this so many times on the show, how people would rather just go with a will because it's cheaper to have done, but in the long run you're going to have some problems. And and we've talked so much about how a trust makes so much more sense. It's going to cost you a little more, but 
It does cost a little bit more. But what we try to say is we're not trying to offer something that we're not willing to do. So when a client comes in, if they are adamant that, you know, they may come in wanting one thing, they may walk out wanting something else. But we will work with them at whatever level that they come in and whatever they want to do. There are things that can be done with a will to accomplish a lot of their goals. It just may not accomplish all all of their goals. And one of the things that people don't understand is there's work to be done, whether you have a trust or whether you get a will in place after you walk out of our doors. And we offer support where people can call us and still ask questions after those documents are drafted to make sure that their beneficiary designations, regardless of whether they have a will or a trust, try to avoid probate at all costs. Yeah. But when they're looking at things such as you had a, a, a client come in with a million dollars, you know, and that sounds like a lot of money, but it can, if someone has a serious health condition, that may be gone very quickly if you don't get out in front of it. And that's the thing is that, especially with the inflation we've seen, yes. I mean, the value of, I was assuming th- this to be a middle-class person, and you think about, wow, a million dollars is mm-hmm. a lot of money, but... But you know, you own a house that that has appreciated. We'll assume mm-hmm. so. Maybe it was a three hundred thousand dollar house. Now it's worth four hundred mm-hmm. or four fifty. They have four hundred one ks. Those have been going up. Mm-hmm. I mean, if if you just follow the Dow or S and P, so mm-hmm. there's an, what would have been three hundred thousand is now four hundred and something, and then you have miscellaneous other assets. So it, it, we have to get used to the idea that that a, somebody in the middle class very likely has at least 500,000 in assets and in, in many cases as much as a million bucks. Right. Do you, you, th- you think that's true? I, I do. I mean, it, some of the clients that I was sitting down with, I've actually been surprised at where their finances are at this time and how much they still worry uh, based on where their finances are. Um, it is important to find out from someone. Sometimes you need to manage their expectations on whether they think they're going to be on Medicaid. We're seeing a lot of clients that are actually talking about long-term care earlier. So in their 40s and early 50s, we can actually talk talk to them and, and it's you know it's something that we can coordinate with um, their financial planner to look at what the goals are and to see if they're you know going to be able to qualify for um, long-term care as opposed to doing Medicaid planning so the younger people that we have coming in um, you know that's always an option for them if somebody is higher than their 50s you know they're already in their 60s and they may already have a health consideration then we sometimes have to have a pragmatic conversation about whether they're uh, expecting that they may need to get or one of them may need to get on Medicaid at some point and talk about um, what you see as the hierarchy of urgency by that I mean um, what document would you typically, and I realize this can vary, mm-hmm. but knowing no more than I just described to you about this example, what would you regard as the greatest urgency perhaps among the various documents that you would say these people need in place? So first of all, if you're talking about any type of health considerations, and we normally ask a general question of like, is everyone in good health? Is there anything coming up um, that is leading you? What is the impetus to you looking at, look, you know, getting an estate plan? And if there's any health concern, having a living will, a HIPAA authorization, and a health care power of attorney are paramount. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's what I thought you would say. I was mm-hmm. curious. Uh and I, I want people to to get that. Of all the things that you need to do most urgently is have something in place where if something happens to you, it could be a car, it, this could be a 30-year-old sure. person. But especially when you get above 60, we know the probabilities increase that some health crisis is going to occur. But it could occur in the form of a car accident where where suddenly in an instant, you're not in a position to make decisions for yourself. Talk about the the consequences of that because most people think oh well that's okay my wife will make them for me yes and so I I think it's interesting because married couples don't worry about it nearly as much as single people single people think oh wow you know I'm over eighteen and of course I need these documents because no one's authorized to make these decisions but there is a possibility that both parties will become incapacitated at the same time um, or that after someone loses loses a spouse they don't have anything in place they no longer have a spouse and therefore no one is is uh, authorized to make those decisions for them. And then also as husband and wife, meaning um, 
Uh, it, it's true that, for example, they have joint accounts. There are things that if you're married, you know, some things, some advantages you have is that your wife, if, if he or she wasn't injured, uh, then, yeah, they can get to certain assets. But the bottom line is most of the most important assets they can't get to, right? Correct. Um, and that it plays into your durable power of attorney, your financial power of attorney as well. So having both of those documents, the health care and the financial, um, and having your spouse authorize them as the first person is very important. And, and you made, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you made a point that that I've glossed over. You There are two of those. In the health care document, it's true that if you have a spouse, that spouse can make decisions relating to health care. Is that true? Mm-hmm. So without the document, you're relying on the goodness of the hospital to say, okay, you'd be next in line anyway. But with the document, you have a very clear authorization. And not only that, you get the opportunity before anything has happened to you to kind of lay out what your parameters are and what your wishes are for your health care. So even if your spouse is following them, they don't feel like the same pressure is on them to decide what you would have wanted. It's all clearly documented. Yeah. So you're never going to get a word in here. I know. So I know. I know. But, but I, I want this to be clear. I, I, I don't want anybody watching this show to walk away and think, oh, they used a lot of terms and they assumed we knew stuff we didn't. So there are two pieces of paper, we'll call it here, two documents. One is giving someone the authority to make decisions about your health care, just your health care. And it's true that some hospitals are a little casual and they'll mm-hmm. let a family member do that. It's not the law that says they can do that. But as a practical matter, hospitals will sometimes let somebody. But that's you, you don't want to count on— You don't want to take that risk. That, that, that's not a good policy mm-hmm. is to count on the, the particular individual at a particular hospital. And and so there's that issue. So you want that document. But the other document that I start, that I dropped in was talking about was the one that gives someone authority over all of your finances, all your personal right. affairs. And, and that, you know— your spouse, again, if he or she, assume you have a spouse, number one. Number two, that your spouse is in a condition where they can play this role. Uh, they they can do some things. They can do assets like money that's in a joint account. But a lot of the most important assets they cannot do, including transactions involving real estate, if they need money, and real estate is a way to get money through loans and debt and mortgage, et cetera. Another is 401ks, de- deferred compensation mm-hmm. assets. I mean, so there are a lot of important assets, not to mention government documents where you're accessing benefits. You need someone who can sign legally as the authorized representative of that person who's now uh, on a incubator? Well, incapacitated in any way. Um, Just, you know, if they're deemed to be incapacitated, they're not with it enough to handle their own finances, then the agent, their financial agent can step in, uh, who would normally be their spouse, but can be anybody that they designate. Now, Nina, I've got a question. Say you have someone that's a widow and they have three children and they uh, have to designate someone for their health care power of attorney, they can't decide. So they put all three of them. That can run into real problems because what, what happens? I mean, they may not all agree with what direction, you know, the hospital takes with their parent. Right. So we go on record as saying that we will draft documents any way that somebody directs us to. But. But. <laughs> but there's always that but. Um, but, you know, even the person that you have as your health care power of attorney may not be the same person that you would list as your primary financial power of attorney. Right. So you have to look at the personalities of your children which they would have to be over 18 anyway, and say, who can handle this stress best? Who can actually handle this decision and make the best decision that I would make best? And we counsel people to usually name no more than two people. And then we can draft it so that if there is someone who's unavailable, the other agent can act, provided there hasn't been an, an express intent by the by the second agent to the contrary. In normal terms, that means you can't do something if you know that the other sibling already disagrees with you if you've been appointed together. But, but how what, do you resolve? Are you about to ask that yeah, question? Yeah, well, yeah. If they, if if two siblings have equal roles with the health care power of attorney, and they're not in agreement with who who makes the decision, um, how is it resolved? Yeah. So 
if you're talking about a decision, which is everybody comes in and they're like, where's the pull the plug document, you know? Well, um, yeah. So the default would be to not because that's something you can't take uh, say, back. So if there's disagreement, then you wouldn't. And they can go to court at that point, but that's what you're trying to avoid right. by these documents. So very rarely, some states will not even allow you to make uh, an appointment of co-agents uh, for health care power of attorney because of that issue. Well, and, and you can also simply have an odd number. So, mm-hmm. I mean, well, you're, it's right to not want more than two, um, but at least if you have three, you don't have the 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 log jam that you potentially would have. Correct. But uh, I do think though that 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 your emphasis on somebody who can make decisions well, who's responsible, whose judgment is good, who really has a relationship with the client that that is sufficiently intimate mm-hmm. to know what they would want, and and don't you think geographical proximity is in and of itself an important. I, qualification. I do, particularly for healthcare. Now, not everybody has that luxury. You may have children that you trust implicitly. They may have a healthcare background. You're not going to pass over them because they live in another state at that point if they have the background to right. really make an educated decision. But let's just say that you have equally qualified children, one in state and one out of state. You should definitely name the one that can actually sit in the you know, waiting room and speak to the physicians as updates are happening. Um, go to meetings about what to do next with regard to your care. Um, that's just the best of the scenarios there. But mm-hmm. that person may not be a money person. And so, again, you know, if you have somebody who's out of state who really is great with money, a lot of things can be done remotely when it comes to your finances. But for health care, I think it's better to have them in town. Yeah, it uh, and and it it really does depend on the number and types of transactions that are going on. So keep in mind that this person would be the person who would have the authority to do everything except those things related specifically to healthcare. They could sign a lease agreement. Uh, they could sign a rental agreement. They can um, subscribe you to. Uh, YouTube or to, uh, <laughs> you know, or to streaming service on your television. So the, it could end up being a lot of stuff. So this is very client specific, isn't it? It is. We tend to go towards broader powers for our agents so that they can do what they need to do. But we also don't recommend that you name somebody to have what's called present powers. We don't think that you should make your kid automatically when you walk out of the door the power of attorney over all of your financial matters as of the date that you sign that document. It really should be what's called springing. And so a lot of people don't know what that is and they hear it. Springing power of attorney, meaning it springs into action. This document is now effective as of the date of your incapacity because they don't really need it before then. Yeah. And at that time, though, it is important to look at there are certain things that you may not need. You may not need a gifting provision in your power of attorney if you're not concerned about taxes and something kind of crept up on you. So we want to make sure that when you walk out, your document has everything that could ever be an issue for you in that power of attorney so that your power of attorney is not trying to do their job with an arm tied behind their back. Right. But we also don't want to give them so much leeway that it's confusing or that it gives them, you know, just an opportunity to make decisions that you may not have made yourself. Right. And we've all heard the nightmare stories where a parent will put their adult child um, on their home, on the title to their home. And we oh. know what can happen See. there. They could lose that house if that child, adult child gets a divorce, gets into legal trouble, sued. Yeah. Not a good idea. Yeah. And, yeah. And Gosh, you know, when people come in, they say, oh, I'm not worried about things ending up in probate. I already added my one kid onto my bank accounts. <laughs> and I and I said, well, don't you have multiple children? And they said, oh, no, my kid will just give the rest of the money um, equally and equal shares to the rest of my children. And I've got that all figured out. I mean, so we can't, you know, you, you'd have to stop and say, maybe we're not going to talk about gift tax returns today, but at least let's talk about the fact that, that's not how any of no, this works. Right, right. <laughs> and and um, people need to realize that there is an element of trust involved in this. Now, the law, if you were to say, what is the legal 
obligation of someone who's in this role that that somebody has selected. I mean, it's a huge obligation from the law standpoint. Yes. I mean, it, it's called a fiduciary, which is, it's it's the highest of standards. I mean, it's very, ex- as a matter of fact, it's so exacting that they almost, sometimes people don't want to have an investment role if they're required to invest with a standard of a fiduciary because it's right. so high. Right. So that's true legally. But the point I was going to make is that while that's true from the law standpoint, really these people don't have somebody looking over their shoulder. It's not a judge who's no. who's looking over their shoulder. What they do is generally without court involvement, they run your life for you, which is the the, the game plan that they, they do it for you in a way that, you know, is not about them. It's strictly about your best interest. So it, you, you don't want people looking over their shoulders and they're reporting to a judge like you would have in a guardianship right. or a conservatorship, which would be the alternative to this, heaven forbid. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, and and we didn't talk about this. Um, you, it will come to this. You can explain what happens if they don't have this document. Anyway, so so the whole idea is, is, is this supposed to be efficient and and practical and inexpensive? So So letting this person be free to go about their day unhindered, right? But of course, that produces opportunities for mischief, and lots of mischief. Lots of mischief. We've talked and, about it on the show. We've had and, stories about it. And especially when you have provisions in there that that says, as Nina was referring to, sometimes rich people, for tax reasons, will have a provision that allows this person to give things away, including to the 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 person who you've appointed, mm-hmm. and 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 often those are wonderful ideas. You you may want that if you have a whole lot of money. Tax laws change. Imagine you had a billion dollars and the tax laws change and and this you can't give it away because remember you're not you're not competent at this point. So without that language, you know, your 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 son or daughter that you trust could not be free to follow the tax lawyer's advice to transfer those and save hundred maybe a hundred million dollars in taxes on that billion dollars. So that's the reason you have provisions like that. But but as you said, you don't want to just throw those in no. because it means that that the child may decide, you know, mom really did always love me more or, <laughs> or you know, I'm I here. I deserve this. I'm here in St. Louis. I'm doing all this work. What if Bill and Jerry in Denver and Portland or wherever they are, heaven forbid, uh, you know, what are they doing? I'm here doing all the work. So maybe mom would want me to have 75% of the assets. So, and they could just give it to themselves. So that's the danger, as you were saying, of too much authority. Can you talk about what, and I don't want to run anybody off from, from having this instrument. You can put in checks and balances, uh, but, the, but the thing is, the reason you want this instrument to have somebody who automatically be, begins taking care of you the moment something happens. No judge has to hear this. The moment you have a stroke, for example, 10 seconds later, legally, this child or th- this daughter, son, whoever, immediately has authority to, to start paying for your health care, to start moving things around that you need done in this crisis, applying for federal benefits and other things. Talk about what are the consequences if somebody doesn't have in place this thing we've been talking about, this durable power of attorney. It's the, it's essentially the equivalent of ending up in probate. It's like the first round of probate before probate. Because it's the worst kind of probate. It really is mm-hmm. because the because the person that you care about is currently there incapacitated and you don't have the tools to properly take care of them or have the authority to advocate on their behalf. Um, and that's really what these roles are supposed to be. The power of attorney for healthcare, the power of attorney for financial matters are to allow you to have an advocate when you can't act for yourself. So you can petition the court at that time, depending on what you're trying to accomplish for either a guardianship or a conservatorship or both. Um, you have have to demonstrate to the court, you have to get a lawyer and you have to demonstrate to the court that they are either, you know, in some cases of mental health issues could be a danger to themselves um, or not able to care for their basic needs. In most cases where people are seeking these things, it's because of a health issue. And you're looking at how can I help this person manage their finances, which would require a conservatorship? And oftentimes that conservatorship will require a bond 
because you want to make sure that the person who has the control over the funds is acting in a way that is consistent with what the court would have specified. So there are a lot of financial investments required to get to this point um, of the level of control that you need in order to properly look after this person. And, And then on an ongoing basis... This person, you know, reports to the judge, right? And Correct. they have to do an accounting. And, At least annually. Yeah, which is money. And, and who's paying for all this legal activity? So you, it, it isn't the type of thing that can come out of the finances of that person. You individually have to pay to try to get the guardianship. Um, so wow. that's out of somebody, that's out of the pocket of a loved one. Correct. And And sometimes there's competition, meaning because... Uh, you, the client, didn't indicate whether you wanted it to be, you know, a son, daughter, a brother, or sister. Since you didn't indicate that, you may have more than one person that thinks that, oh, she would have wanted me to mm-hmm. be the one. Right. So then you have full-blown litigation. Correct. And and how long is it? I can't imagine a case pending for a year. It matters whether it's an emergency, but, you know, when you're in that type of level of crisis, everything seems like an emergency to you. It may not look like an emergency to the court, so you could get pushed back on the docket. And the types of things that have happened during the COVID crisis have made court dockets very, very long. And so there are significant delays to any type of litigation at this time. Nina, I have a question. and I know this is a very unusual situation. Say you have a woman, a mother, and she has a severe stroke, incapacitated, and then the medical power of attorney, or the, I'm sorry, the financial power of attorney kicks in because it doesn't appear this lady's ever going to recover. Well, say a few months down the road, she recovers, she's mentally competent. Does she assume back control toward that power of attorney? I mean, do you have to go to court again or what happens? Since there wasn't a court order that actually made the power of attorney come into place, there are provisions in the power of attorney that say that if you regain your capacity, you automatically can act upon on your own behalf. So again. that's automatically there. In, in contrast, place. in contrast to what we've been following where where this conservatorship, I'm just telling you, it, it definitely is better to have a world, a society in which there is a conservatorship and guardianship available. So though I'm harshly critical of it, I'm only harshly critical because there's something better and so much easier and so much simpler uh, that, that there's just no excuse for not having it. But if we couldn't have this other simple, easy thing, I'd say, yeah, we got to have a conservatorship because some th- these things have to be done that we were just talking about. Uh, and you do want a judge to oversee it if you, the the victim or the person who's who needs the care, since you didn't express your wishes, we don't, the court doesn't know who to trust and who you would want and even what your values would be. So it's very difficult for the court. And it's very expensive. So once you end up in court and you have a guardianship and you have a, a conservatorship, guardianship relates to your physical care. Conservatorship relates to all your financial stuff, uh, all the non non you know personal care things. Who was it we we're dealing with? That Britney Spears. Britney Spears. Yes. So that that is a cautionary tale because once you have a guardianship and conservatorship created, as Nina was just saying. You need a judge to come back and dismiss it. That means if you recover from a stroke or whatever and you want to resume control of your life, you don't have control until a judge decides that he thinks you should have You're control. You're competent again, yeah. I mean, so all these, I, I hope that that these red flags that we've been raising and, and waving here in this discussion about you know, taking that very simple step of getting in place a durable power of attorney as well as a durable power of attorney for health care. So there's a general durable power of attorney under the statute, which relates to financial and all other stuff. And then, of course, the health care. So easy and and relatively inexpensive. Correct. What, what might it cost to get that? What is Tucker Allen? So generally, you know, if you go to our website, you'll see that we have packages. So we recommend that people have 
their powers of attorney done in conjunction with Other a will. Other documents. However, um, we do have single documents that we can do for one person for a health care power of attorney and a financial power of attorney. We can charge fi- maybe $500 um, yeah. to get those documents in place. And the health care power of attorney is actually three documents. It has your HIPAA, which allows you to specify who can access your medical records, um, and also your living will, which talks about your wishes for end of life or life prolonging measures. And that's a very important document because some people think it's the same thing as a a DNR. And it is not. Say what DNR is. A do, do not, not resuscitate. resuscitate. Yeah. So everybody thinks it's like, oh my goodness, it's it's something t- saying that I've already got a you know terminal condition, and therefore if I, you know if I happen to pass out or something, that they're not going to revive me. And that is not at all the case. Somewhere very much between that and not having anything documented at all is where your living well and is. And they can be very detailed. Absolutely. Tailored. I mean, you know. It, it could be something like, okay, if I have, you know, 10 infections in a year, then, you know, I'm done. No more treatment or something. Like, I mean, I'm just making that up. To an extent, but generally it has to do with something that you wouldn't be able to make decisions for yourself on. Yeah. And that is artificial nutrition. Um and a ventilator, things of that nature, if you're not expected to reasonably recover within, you know, a six to 12 month period. Yeah. And that's an important point to emphasize is as long as you're able to make decisions, you override this document. No one can override your decision. I'll say it that way. No, no right. person can can say, I want this and you say, I don't, and they succeed. So it's only when you're incompetent, incapacitated, um, comatose, whatever, that that this would would uh, trump you or to the extent you had an opinion. Right. Uh, so it's, I mean, there, there are many, many reasons to have it and really none to not have it. Uh, one thing I want to uh, call attention to, and, and these are, are the reasons that this is not a form. Um, there are a number of important decision points that you want to think about in your durable power of attorney which I agree with you when you said that that's the first thing that you had mentioned you would bring to a client's attention in order of priority. I think it's the single most important document for you to have because it relates to you for the rest of your life. Now, some of you may say, well, I don't care about me. I just care about my family while I'm gone. Okay, for you, I guess those, those other things would be more important, which we'll touch on here in a minute. But I just think that this, this single document is the most important thing you should have in place. 500 bucks, I mean, something like that just to have a document like this. And and one one thing I really want to emphasize is, you know, be really distrustful of forms. Um, th- there are at least five or six key paragraphs I can think of in this document that, depending on where you went or or if you were ordering forms, heaven forbid, you could have any one of the answers to these key components. And this is just five to six paragraphs off the top of my head. One you mentioned is. You know, do you want it to spring into effect only when something has happened? And there are legitimate arguments that that say, um, to be honest with you, I'll make a confession to you. My general w- rule was the opposite when I was preparing these, but I get it. I know there's a lot of authority for your position. So, but it goes to show you reasonable people can disagree um, as do you want it to be in effect immediately or do you want it to only spring into effect when it's valid? And and the the point you're making, Nina, is you know, why give somebody this power over over everything you own? Well, I have a compromise for you, Mr. Cordell, though, because uh-huh. um, we also can prepare it so that it is automatically effective for a spouse, but only springs into uh-huh. effect for anyone other than your See, spouse. I mean, so there's, there's kind so, of a hybrid. So many ways, and and this is really not an effort to tout. Uh, Tucker Allen services. I would say this to you: if you're in another city and or another state and couldn't use Tucker Allen, I, I would say always go, always pay the extra money to go to a firm that just practices in this area. And yes, you will pay more. Done. I grant you that than ordering a form. But I, I can tell you the benefits so far outweigh the additional costs that it's an insult to to your intelligence to decide that you're going to save $400 or whatever it is by ordering a form. It's just, it makes no sense. I mean, this is going to impact the rest of your life. 
Uh, yeah, and everything's it's, on the table. And, and you get what you pay for. You re- they're missing things. They definitely are. I've yeah. recently looked at one uh, because... I have a very big family, and I had a sibling who didn't want to come to me <laughs> and downloaded oh, a form. Siblings don't like for other siblings to see their <laughs> no. stuff. And so they sent me the form, and sure enough, there was no authority with respect to digital assets, meaning anything that's electronically held. There, It didn't provide any authority whatsoever. And now there are laws both in Missouri, Illinois, and, and many other states that uh, will back up those things provided that the authority is given in these documents. And we spell out those provisions very carefully because there are things that are practical and there are even digital assets that are sentimental. And you want your power of attorney to be able to access all of those. Yeah, and um, and I'm thinking of another provision where, uh, tying in with what we were talking about a few minutes ago, some forms think the best thing to do is to give somebody the maximum authority that the state allows. So it'll be one form that's sold in all 50 states. Mm-hmm. So they'll use language like, so the the holder of this document uh, will have a th- as far, have authority to include all things that the statute can possibly permit, words to that mm-hmm. effect, to the greatest extent of the, of the law. And what that does is, depending on what state it's in, it may allow them to change your estate planning. Meaning, do you want, do you really want this person to be able to change your trust to where it redistributes assets in your trust? Uh, we talked about an exceptional circumstance a few moments ago where you allow somebody to give gifts themselves. For most people, that's scary. And you'd, you'd want to do that very cautiously uh, with lots of rules. And, and unless you're rich and foresee that situation, you'd absolutely ban it. You would never have a provision that would allow someone to change your estate planning to benefit themselves in any way. So those are things, though, that if you don't go into a lawyer's office and sit down in front of them and talk to them about it, those are the sorts of things that commonly you find in forms because their goal is, you know, if you if you want to make only one size shoe and, and you want to fit everybody, then you end up making the largest shoe possible. Um, and unfortunately, when you do that with documents, it, it's often a, a, a calamity. So I think that on this topic, we've, we have uh, succeeded in communicating the importance of, of these very simple and inexpensive forms. Let, we're going to take a quick break. We'll come back in just a few minutes. Uh, we wanted to, to touch on uh, two other key components to a basic estate plan. We'll do that very quickly. Um, before we go into the break, I want to mention, be sure and subscribe and hit the like button. Uh, these are these are huge. You know how it works. It's critical to our being, on, being able to get the word out about these shows. We'd love to have lots of people watching, uh, but we need you in order to do that. So please hit subscribe and like. Uh, we'll be back in a moment. Life's third act. Strong roots are essential for a healthy tree, especially your family tree. That's why you work hard to take care of your family every day. At Tucker Allen, we know that taking care of your family means planning for the future. Our team provides personalized estate planning to help ensure that your family and your legacy are protected and that your future is secure. From wills and trusts to long-term care and estate planning. Count on Tucker Allen. Personalized estate planning made simple. Coming back to Life's Third Act. Uh, So in the next few minutes, let's hit on... I guess maybe the other two legs of the stool. I think this is a three-legged stool. It is. Okay. I was so one leg would be what a a tr- revocable trust. Uh, yes, a revocable trust or a or a will, um, depending on what the primary document that would dictate the disposition of assets. Meaning, where is all of your stuff going to go? Okay. Um, so there are a couple of options, and we really try to find out, you know, does somebody have something in place already? The client may already have a will, and it may have very specific provisions in it about every little thing in their life and where it's going to go. But there are simpler, um, easier to update ways of accomplishing this. Um, so give an example, like someone may have have thought that, first of all, they thought they should have a will, Mm -hmm. and there's a good chance they shouldn't have a will. Correct. Um, And so if you talk about that, but also they thought in their will they needed to take every individual object 
maybe mm-hmm. that they own yes. and give it to a particular person. Yes. So this is a detailed long. Yes. And I love reading them because they're usually very interesting documents, but they are not extremely efficient and they become dated very easily. Now you can say, okay, well, if somebody gives something away during their lifetime, it just gets uh, you know, you strike it out of the will after they pass away. So you have to figure out what's there and what's not. But there is something called a tangible personal property list. And that is something that is actually legally enforceable provided it is signed and dated and can be filed with the will. And what that does is the latest signed and dated version of it that says, here's the object, here's who I want it to go to. Doesn't work with cars or houses, but just for your stuff. Things that don't have documents of time. Correct. So like I, I, a, a china set, a family yes. heirloom. Pianos, books. All personal property with the exception of those those Correct. things that have a document of title, which are unusual. And it's um, now, you do still have to sign and date it. I had someone come in with, their husband had three of them and none of them were signed and none of them were dated. And she, out of the goodness of her heart, was going to try to enforce everything that was there uh, to his children that he'd had from a previous he marriage. He had passed away. He had passed yeah. away. Um, so he had a, a binder with three different lists in it. So but, she didn't say, wait, I can just go ahead and sign it here and we'll just backdate it. No. <laughs> <laughs> she did not, and we would never advise her to do that. But I'm um, sure that happens. I'm, it possibly does. Or she could have just not shown it to me at all because it were all, they were all things that were going to go to his children, um, and she was continuing on as the surviving spouse. So it was very nice that she was so honest and, and also benevolent about it. But generally, it's a really great form because guess what? If you change your mind one day or your form's getting a little messy and you want to rewrite something else, I can give you a new blank one and that whatever you fill out on the new form will actually replace that prior form and you don't have to pay me to draft a new will for you. Yeah, yeah. And that's what's nice is that is to be able to have a relationship with your estate planning lawyer that you want to have for the rest of your life. Just like most of us, when we have a general practitioner that we like, who's a doctor, for example, we want to have a, a relationship as long as as long as we one of the two of us shall live, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So now, I, some of us have doctors that are older than we are, so we have to worry. But but for the most part, you'd like to think that your estate planning lawyer, unlike your divorce lawyer, is somebody that that you're going to be able to talk with and and stay in touch with and update you know, for the balance of your life. Absolutely. Or the firm, at least. Absolutely. If that person is older or retires or something. And that's why, you know, keeping good records and really not just listening to what we're doing today, but developing a baseline for where that client is today. So if they come back in five or 10 years, or if their children come back to you and they need estate planning, you have a point of reference. Um, you mm-hmm. have all of the information that you need to really take a an active approach to helping them plan. So let's mention the other... I had two other legs of the stool, and uh, you kind of got them both in there. So one leg would be a, a, a and I, I get your point that you're more conscientious about, you know, saying the correct thing legally. I'm, I'm a little reckless sometimes. So I, I, I've jumped to the conclusion that pretty much everybody should have a revocable trust. And that's not technically true. There are some people that, that maybe a will's okay. There, so we, we say that we can get scrappy to help you if you just determined that you only need a will um, mm-hmm. because we can help you title your assets so that particularly if you only have one kid or something like that and you don't care when that kid gets their money and you don't think they're ever going to get divorced or sued. You know, mm-hmm. all of these what ifs. That Where it's it can still, do no harm. It's still good to have something in place that exercise, you know, that, that spells out what your wishes are. But mm-hmm. generally, if you have any concerns, if you have grandchildren that may be inheriting something at some point, if you are concerned that anyone will ever have state benefits that's going to inherit from you, um, or if you, you know, blended families are very common nowadays. It is almost impossible to put together a will that will accommodate your wishes with respect to a blended family. Right. You're uh, you're essentially saying what what I would have thought, and that's that. You know, in the vast majority of cases, you need a revocable trust, um, and and yet th- there are some people who will simply say, "Give me a will," and having a will is better than nothing. So I don't want to be too critical of that. But for some people, a will is still going to invite a fight at probate. Because a, a will, remember, a will always means probate. 
always means probate of some form. Even if you're broke, it's still an administration, administrative probate, which is real simple, incidentally. But if you have any assets, and I mean any assets to speak of, I think we're talking about anything above 50000 Mm-hmm. Is it like fifty thousand uh, dollars? It's forty thousand in Missouri, a hundred thousand in Illinois. But it, there is no way of transferring real property, meaning pro- a, a house or or anything like that, in Illinois. So even if you have that higher limit, you can't do it. And and it's you know a small estate in Missouri. Here's a wrinkle there. That's the administrative program yeah. you were talking about. You are required to have an attorney. So if you have a $1,700 401k that is stuck in an account and you have to have a small estate, you actually have to hire an attorney in order to file that document in Missouri. I, I, wow. I'm going to try to resist going down this road. What the statute in Missouri. You have to be leery of probate in every state because probate law is the product of a lot of influence by the bar in that particular state. Um, And if you doubt it, read the statute in Missouri, which I can't cite what the the statute is relating to compensation. It's it's in the statute Mm -hmm. what the lawyers are to be paid in probate, meaning you don't have to guess. You can look it up. And except that it states, it if you read it and you see that it's percentages based on the size of the estate, which caps out, I think, at about 5% of the estate. And, or the hourly fee, depending on whichever, whichever is, is higher. higher. Not which is lower. So it's at least 5% of the estate. And, and now think about this for a minute. A million dollars, that's $50,000. You think, well, $50,000, that must require a whole lot of work. Well, it may require... Very little work. I mean, just because it's a million dollars doesn't mean that 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 you put in more work. If it's a million dollars going to your son or your daughter, say you have two children, 50-50 each. It's all sitting in cash accounts or cash equivalents. You die. In that case, they'd be entitled to fifty, at least $50,000. And remember, the statute says at least, a minimum of. So $50,000, let's assume that's all you pay. What What is that per hour that that lawyer has earned? So, so you need to understand why probate is very lucrative. Now, I, I get it that that you know probate can be complicated too, and and it's possible that lawyers will work very hard. Uh, but I suspect if they work very hard, they're going to get paid because they'll get the higher number, which is the hourly rate. So, um, there are lots of reasons to not want a will. Is our point here, and that's just one of them. It and another thing is put aside the lawyer fees, put aside the delay. You know, you can be sure of one thing. There will be probate if you have a will. And a lot of people don't understand that. They, they think somehow it got started. The story was, well, you need to have a will so you can avoid probate. Yeah. And I don't know how that got started because probate came into existence in order to assure that wills were legitimate, that the people who are supposed to get the assets get the assets. Right. So, so probate came about in a way to authenticate um, people's express wishes on pieces of paper. That's how it came into existence. So there's a way to avoid all that, and that's the other leg of the stool. And and we won't talk much about it now because we're we're almost out of time. We're at 51 minutes. So so let let's save this for the next show we do. And let's make a note to come back to this. And and we'll just talk to you about revocable trust. This is not a complicated subject. And and I'm even bold enough to say it's not necessarily a boring subject. Uh, I think we can make it interesting even. Uh, but but this is so important for you to understand that that this tool is helpful not only when you go, yeah, you don't want to you want to avoid probate and you want to minimize what you pay lawyers, et cetera. Uh, but there are even better reasons, reasons that are relevant to you while you're alive why, that you may want to think about having revocable trust. So this is, this is all the stuff, Nina and her lawyers, this is all they do at Tucker Allen, period. So, so we really want to draw on that, that reservoir of knowledge. So we'll do this again. We'll talk about that third leg and, and talk about why it's so important. Uh, just real quickly, the reason I characterize it as three legs, you may think, well, gee, if I'm doing the, the revocable trust, I don't need a will. But we'll explain this a little more next time. But when you do a revocable trust, you, you, you do just this... 
It's called a pour over will. It's, it, it's in all likelihood will play no role. All you're doing is backstopping your planning. So technically you do have a, a will, but the whole idea is that to never end up in probate. The whole idea is you, you know, it's never used, but you want to know that, that there is this backup plan in the event that something happened um, with respect to your trust. And we'll talk about that next time. Anyway, uh, covered Nina, a lot of ground. We've we covered a lot of ground. Uh, so we'll have Nina back. We'll talk a little more about the subject of revocable trust, and we'll, we'll make it our um, determination to make this as interesting as possible. So with that, this has been another episode of Life's Third Act. Till next time, take care. You've been listening to Life's Third Act a podcast for thriving in retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, your estate and elder law advisors. Each week we discuss topics and answer questions to help you better plan for your future. For more information, visit tuckerallen.com. Subscribe and listen again next week for another edition of Life's Third Act. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements.